Thank you very much. Let me start talking because I only have 25 minutes. Um, <laughs> and uh, let me just get to it right away. That um, first, that I'm really, really pleased to be here. Um, the um, uh, for a couple of reasons, and one of them actually, this will be the chance that I I uh, I can thank a uh, thank a particular individual that uh, got me start with with all these, and uh, she's in the audience. This is actually Louise, so Lu Louise does not know what story I'm going to tell. She's going to get a little bit nervous, but um, I will get to it. That actually really thank to you that I get into this uh, sort of line of work. Um, I want to really thank organizer, particularly Nick and uh, uh, Luis, to invite me here. Uh, both of them asked me to try to provoke, trying to, uh, um, what's the word you use? Shock the system. All right, I will do my best, OK? Um, and uh, so let me just get to the, the point. Um, a few years ago, it's probably four or five years ago, I learned from Peter Hall. And unfortunately, Peter is no longer with us. Peter would be very pleased uh, for things like this happen. He basically told me at that time, he said, you know, we're in trouble. Now, so that was what he told me about. And I said, well, what, what trouble you're in? He talked about the mathematical statistics, you know, the, these educations. And he actually wanted me to come here. He knew that I was doing a few things at Harvard. He wanted me to, to come here to talk about, which we never get a chance to arrange. It. So this is actually uh, something really uh, very nice as a, as a, uh, you know, a tribute to, uh, you know, to Peter. Um, let me get to the key message right away in case I get a cut off in the end without the chance to deliver the uh, punchline. I want to talk about statistical education and educating statistics. Uh, these two things are clearly related to each other, but they're different. Uh, what do I mean by that? I think uh, most people would, have, would have agree that educating statisticians are about training the future statisticians. That pretty much has been emphasis by many, uh, at least the research university in the US for many years. Educating stati statistical education is really much more broad. The idea is to having sort of statistical literacy, having more people you know, have the basic understanding of the statistics. Um, these things are tends to be, as I said, they are very much re related, but one of them gets more emphasized than the other. And you probably can guess which one, okay? The key message I want to deliver today, and this is both based on experience at Harvard, as well as experience from other fields, particular life science, that if you want to uh, produce future statisticians, even you just want to do that, you want to do more broad education. The idea here is that if you put too much emphasis on training the specialist, you actually don't do well in either part. You put a little bit more emphasis, appropriate amount of emphasis to train you more broadly, you get a much larger audience. You get a much larger pool for training your future statisticians. So the idea here is really um, what I try to use this uh, analogy, like you know, you think about a wine connoisseur, there are many of them. Uh, we need to train both kinds, but it's actually very important to make sure that you, on, you don't only focus on training the specialist, then you don't get the general appreciation and you don't get the pool you need. Okay, so that's basically the, the message I want, I want to deliver. Then I want to just give you a few uh, sort of uh, examples of how we did it and give you some data since we're stat statisticians here. Let me just to, uh, get a very quick um, pool. Again, I'm collecting data. How many of you will very proudly label yourself as a statistician? Okay, wow, it's majority. How many of you will be very proud to label yourself as a non-statistician? Not as a statistician. OK, good. And there, I hope that covers everyone, right? Um, OK, so most of you um, have the statistical background, so I don't have to go through too much of the uh, details. But I do want to say the reason I have this wine analogy, I do have a credential, I hope, as a, as a PhD uh, from Harvard that I've you know, been 30 years in, in the field. But uh, you may ask, like, what credential do I have to talk about wine? And I want to give you just a little bit of data. Um, this is my wine cellar. So I do, and I do sample it every day. So, uh, so just to give you a little bit. Let me just uh, say very quickly that we all know this well, but it's, it's important to emphasize this, particularly when you present this to, uh, this is the slides I used to present to my dean when I was the department chair, to convince the dean to give us more, more fundings. Uh, what's important is that these days we talk about large, big data, but we have to emphasize it's not just the size. It's the questions are much deeper, and people want to answer much, much faster. Okay? And I think that in the later aspects are the, are the, 
are these tools that we really have to emphasize more in our education. Uh, questions like you know, personali personalized medicine, it's a very, very, very deep question statistically. What do we mean by accumulating statistical evidence to prove something works for you? There's only one unique you. Where do we collect data ever to prove that? How, how do we think about these issues? So I think that these are the type of things that we should really emphasize to our students. Um, we really need to balance the core development with interdisciplinary research. What I mean by that, it's quite obvious these days, statistics being used everywhere, but it, what we statisticians think is what's important is because we have a set of core principles, right? But the problem is that when you're trying to educate a statistic, statisticians or teach gen generally, if you start with the core principles, you lose pretty much everyone before you get, to, before you get them excited. Okay, so that's what you need to think about these balancing these two. And then um, we really need to re-examine the pedagogical and the infrastructure need. Uh, everybody knows that particularly in research university, you have a lot of infrastructure to support research. People help you to write grant proposals. Right? People you know, manage the grants for you. But on the teaching side, they're a lot less. There's a lot less. So this is the part that if you really want to do this large scale education, which I'm going to show you some data, now I'm really talking about large, right? Because there are so many students wanted to do, to do statistics or anything connected with data these days, right? And I think there's just a large pool out there that we can really tap into them if we have the right infrastructure. So let me just uh, uh, tell you that what I've been using the word statistical paradise, trying to emphasize that we are in a paradise, but if we're not careful, we may lose it. Okay. So the key first is, for any educator, what will be viewed as a paradise if, if there's a large pipeline coming. Right? And speaking of pipeline, I just want to show you, I just want to show you this, this, this data. Um, this is the number of concentrators that uh, in statistics in, at the Harvard. Do I have this? Which one is the, yeah. So these are the, these are the data we collected up to 2010. And you know, we used to be on pretty much single digits, and then we were increasing by 60% a year, okay? 2010. So that this data we did at 2010, at that point, we actually uh, did the extrapolation, did a growth curve model, just for the fun, okay? And we predict, you know, these would be number, and as st statisticians, we also predict have a very large bar, right? Now, I'm purposely not updating this, this prediction, because now we have more data. I want you to see how well or how, pow how poorly we did, okay, and why you need the bar. So you already see that by 2011, it was here. 2012 was here. But the bar still covers it, right? That's why you need the bar, okay? 2013, still within the bar. But you can see it slightly slowed down, but this is still exponential growth. Now, the most latest data is right here, almost 200. Right? This has been an enormous growth. These are concentrators. These are students concentrated in statistics, including some joint one. About 10% of them are, you know, are joint, uh, joint concentrators. Uh, what I also been sort of semi joke semi seriously is tell people that the, another reason you know you're in a paradise is you have a much better airplane, taxi, party conversations. It used to be the case that if I want to stop talking, if I want the, my next passenger to stop talking to me, I just t tell him or her I teach statistics. That's the end of the conversation. <laughs> it did not work once. The guy said I teach mathematics, so that was uh, another story. Uh, it's really a golden era for methodological research. As I mentioned, for example, personalized medicine is one of the, one of the many things. I don't have time to get into this. But uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, emerging theoretical foundation comes out. So this is a part about training not just the uh, general sort of a connoisseur, but also the masters, you, uh, the winemakers. You really need uh, this type of uh, foundational training. Now, I want to show you another data. Uh, this is a, the one I just showed you was the concentrators number of concentrators or, or majors. This is the data, again, of about 2008, 2010-ish, is the total number of students take, take statistics at Harvard. Uh, take a statistic, I should have said take statistics at Harvard. That's actually, that's a much larger number. Take the courses offered by statistics department because there are so many other departments offer statistics as well. And you see this was, and again, you know, we did the, we did the fancy ARIMA model to try to predict. We had a very wide bar. I want you to see how poorly or how well we, we did. 
right at the next year, we're already outside the bar. We didn't do well, okay? By now, guess where it is? Over 25. Okay. So, so what do we do? What do we do to have this type of really very substantial increase? Partly, I have to say, even if you don't do anything, it, will, it would have been growing just because the general emphasis of big data, everything, okay? But we also had evidence, some, some university, which I will not mention, uh, that they actually still kept a very small size despite the fact that, that there, there are so many demands out there. So it doesn't matter that how you do it, that uh, um, you know, not to discourage people to, to take, your, take your courses. Nick wants me to talk about US perspective. Um, I told him I can't do that. First is, these days, you know, US has, has too many perspectives. Uh, from extreme left to extreme right, and there'll be perspective even will drive you up a wall, and you still have to pay for it. Um, if you don't get that joke, you haven't followed US perspective yet. Um, but I can talk about an us, the, the lowercase perspective, us, okay? That's me and my colleagues at, the, at Harvard. I want to emphasize how we actually did. Now, I have to confess that we didn't really have a big sort of blueprint Star Wars. We, as we were doing, the, we realized, oh, these are the important things to do. So I'm really telling you our real experience, not sort of some conceived big plan at, at the very beginning. The most important thing I learned later is you have to build a dream team and having a team dream, okay? That is the absolute crucial. And they, here are four, four of them. Three of them actually have deep connection with the Luis uh, department. Uh, this is Joe Blisting. Uh, Joe is the one that I hired in uh, 2006. Uh, he was a student of Percy Diaconus, as some of you may know, Percy. And he turned out to be an absolutely wonderful teacher, okay? He teaches, a, he teaches stat 110. And now in Australia, you have access to YouTube, right? Not like in China, you do have YouTube. Okay, get on YouTube. The entire course, his course, Step 110, is on YouTube. 50, 50 uh, uh, episodes with homework, with everything. And uh, let me just give you one number to show you how effective he, was, he is. When he joined the department in 2006, at that time, we have, um, the Step 110 has about 80 students. This, this is probability. This is not a statistics, probability. Next year, 120, then 180, then 200 something. Then we, every semester, every semester we ask Joe, it got stopped, right? How many people would be interested in, st in probability? It's not even statistics. Guess how many by now? 480. 480 students take probability. And many of our concentrated, what we get, is because this one single course. Because these students, they tell me, say, Charlie, the only reason I become the stack concentrated is because of Joe. Right? Joe gets these raving student evaluations in all sorts of things. One of them probably is most telling. Someone wrote, I want Joe's baby. <laughs> uh, I, won't, I won't go to detail, but that's, that's the... Uh, the other thing I think, uh, let me mention, uh, Dave Harrington uh, was from the Biostech. He helped us a lot. And uh, uh, Kevin is also from Biostech. Uh, he's our pre senior preceptor now, and uh, uh, um, Mike Parson is, is our senior lecturer. So we have this group of people, they are more focused on teaching than research. They all do research, but they're more focused on teaching. You have to have that. I know that's always controversial, particularly in research university. Are you building a second team, second citizen, you know, that type of things. But the thing is, like, the department leadership makes a difference, what, how you... Uh, arrange you know, those, uh, those things. What's the, a great way to enhancing the department pedagogical culture is actually through TF training, teaching fellow training. So how do we do that? That's where actually uh, Luis uh, comes in. Now, uh, in the end, if I have any uh, time, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this course, uh, which I have taught for 11 years, is called uh, The Art and the Practice of Teaching Statistics. It's a required course for every PhD student come to my department. How did I start that course? How did I even have that idea? Thanks to Luis. Now, she, or she may or may not know this. You came to our department, teach STEM 100. That year, you were too popular. The number of, usually it's 150 students. 
she got about like 230 that, that particular year, which means at Harvard, I need to hire another four or five teaching fellows, which means I had to hire after last minute, which means that I hire anyone who can count and breathe. <laughs> Counting is optional, but breathe is important. And uh, these, you immediately get a complaint from students, from Harvard undergraduate students. Why did you put these people who have no qualification whatsoever in front of me? And then, Luis, I don't know if you remember, you also told me you were helping these students, teaching fellows more than they help her, right? Because these are unqualified ones. Three students, walk, three PhD students walk into my office, said, Xiao Li, you guys teach us everything except how to teach. I said, you're right. Nobody ever taught me how to teach, right? So one of them suggests, you need to teach a course on how to teach. And I said, great idea. I would do it myself, because I know if I give somebody else to do it, the thing won't work. The department chair has to take a leadership, but I did not know how to do it. Fortunately, we have a box center for teaching and the learning. And I so went to that center. I met with the director. He was so pleased. The first thing he said, oh, for after so many years, now the staff department chair wanted to talk to me. <laughs> That's how we started. That course has really changed the department culture in terms just from, from that. I don't have time to get into detail, but I want to emphasize, get graduate students, if you have, get a graduate student involved, it's a super beneficial. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more. And also get, if you don't have graduate students in your, in your unit, get upclassmen, you know, get, get some students involved. You will be surprised how many pedagogical ideas they have once you get them involved. Once they feel the ownership, then they can help you so much. You can do a lot more than you try to do everything on, you know, on your own. And this is the thing that really, uh, we, after a few years, as we see what's going on, then both Dave, I remember Dave and I, we, when they had a conversation, we realized, oh my God, that's such a simple thing, but we, we forgot. The see, when we try to training future statisticians, how do you de design the courses? You immediately start thinking about all the mathematical foundations you, these students need to know, right? You set up all these things in a traditional, you know, you, you want them to get all the tools so they can go on to do something great. What's happened there is when you do that, you turn away vast majority of students. They absolutely had no interest. They look at it and say, oh, this is even boring than the pure mathematics, right? It's not even that challenging mathematically. So why, why did they do that? Right? So, so Dave realized, hey, no, what we should do, this really, Dave literally told me, like, what we should do is switch our mind setting. Training broadly, if we get enough people interested in, even there's 10% of them interested in, say, oh, now I want to do statistics. That's a lot more than when we focus on to find these people. When I have 480 take one course, 10% is 48. We were only getting five to 10 a year, right? So it was just as simple as that, it just, it took us a few years to realize, okay? So, uh, so I want to just remind you how important this is. I'm gonna present this to this audience as a serum, okay? As a mathematical serum, why this is important? Especially after a good bottle of Grinch. Um, a serum, there are two ways to increase the numerator. By increase the ratio, or by increase the denominator, right? There's only two ways to do that. Okay, what we did accidentally was by doing these the much more interesting things, we are increasing the numerator, right? Corollary, you know, I used to study mathematics. Uh, the more we make statistics intoxicating, no pun intended, uh, the larger both the numerator and the denominator. So we end up having a lot more students who have far more interest in statistics and they're actually really much better. One year, we actually produced three PhD students for Stanford alone from our concentration. The Stanford said, wow, how do you get these students? My best students ever, ever, he's, he's absolutely wonderful, he's now a PhD student in statistics, was actually undergraduate students at Harvard. He was gonna study Latin, and then he took one course from Joe, he switched to, to statistics, right? And so we just have learned learned enough, enough of these, uh, the, the whole idea is actually very, very simple. The whole idea is that you teach, you get all students very excited about, this is something interesting. And these students are incredibly talented. Once they know they want to do something, they want to learn it, they will find a way to learn all these things. Right, you don't have to push them, okay?
how I'm doing time-wise? Six minutes, okay. In the six minutes, I want to talk very quickly to tell you what I did in this thing called a happy course, and that was aimed as a general education course. This was a course offered at Harvard. This was really trying to motivate the students who otherwise will not study statistics. Okay, but the goal was not tra training them as a future statistician. If I, if I had that mind setting, this would be a complete failure. These students, they, they really did not want to do anything quantitative. Okay? So the way we did it is we actually, instead of introducing statistics by topic, as we traditionally do, normal, T, one sample, two sample, three sample, we never do three sample, you know, do, we, we, do, we do that. This was introduced entirely through, through modules. So I'm showing you some actual slides from the first time I taught this, the, the, this course. This is a module, it's called the wine and the chocolate, okay? Now you will say, what's the statistic comes in? Actually, this was, uh, so I'm gonna show you very quickly, because this is just to show you this example, and I will, the slides will be available to you if you are, if you are interested in, to, to see how we, we did not really sort of dump down the material, we just make them more, more interesting. So what we're trying to do there in this particular one is try to teach them experiment design through wine tasting and teach them analysis of variance, which is always a hard topic for students. Remember, these students, they're afraid of any numbers and we were able to teach them ANOVA, right? So how do we do it? Well, you first talk about wine. Most of them don't really know much about the wine and I use the Riesling because I collect the, uh, collect the Riesling. So, so we talk about Riesling, so this is, a, I even taught them a little bit, I can't pronounce any of those things, you know, this particular sweetness, right? And, and I actually contribute, these are my collections. I actually brought all these wines to the students. Uh, I do have to be careful, they have to be above 21. That's why they're, they're, they're chocolate. For people who can't drink wine, they were testing the, the chocolate part, right? So what I wanted them to really test, to uh, test this idea, you know, does the ordering of testing matter as one of the factorials, you know, factors in factorial design? And the way we did it is we randomize, we teach them how to randomize, right? And then we collect the data, right? We, this is actually, we have four different kinds, blind and the four different orders. And, you know, and what's very interesting is give me a real moment because students themselves, there's a data from themselves, including some graduate students, staff, and, and the faculty, because there were not enough undergraduate students who are, who are above 21. And we, this allows to really teach the concept of, oh, these are them. I, I particularly blur those ones so their parents won't know they were drinking. But these are my teaching fellows, so they're fine. Uh, so here's what happens in, in real life that it, it immediately gets you teach something very interesting. Remember, teach factorial design to students, take a first class at statistics, is a, is a disastrous if you teach from a mathematical perspective. But for this one, they immediately see, well, there's ordering, there is a sweetness the wines, and so I told them, look, this is called two-way factorial design. There are two factors, two-way, right? It's very easy. But immediately we run into a problem because even we designed it very perfectly, it turned out different cell has different number of people in it. In real life, things happen. So we, we immediately told them this is unbalanced design, right? And then one of the cell, for whatever reason, my teaching fellow said there was no data in it. So we immediately run into missing data problem. So we have incomplete data design, right? So concept is now trying to teach them how to analyze, to re make them realize real life things are much more messier. That's the whole, whole, whole message here, right? And then we actually really, you know, taught them how to do the analysis of variance and uh, repeat all the, what's the variation, ask them to look at, we even give these formulas, but now each one we can map to the real data. So these are actual slides. I just want to show you the slides we, we use. And then we, um, we you know, do this ordering, we do the sum of square calculation, and they actually, uh, they have software to do that. And in the end, we basically teach them how to read the table. Now, this sounds terrible because, you know, someone say p-values these days are being banned, right? You don't use p-value, but not then. So we, we were able to talk p-value then. Uh, but the most, most important thing is to ask them get the sense what those things are and where those things, you know, uh, things come from. And uh, we actually invite the outside speaker. This was David Wishar. Um, someone think he's the son of the Wishar. But he declared, he said he's, he's not. He come to give a talk about classifying whiskeys. And uh, because of that, I got 40 bottles of whiskey for free. 
some of them students. So you come to come to Harvard, I'll show you. And uh, we also did the, did the chocolate. And you may, if you remember these movies, that uh, you know that famous line that if you life is like a box of chocolate, you never know what you're going to get. But or punch lines, but you can estimate it, especially after you take take that class. Let me conclude uh, just to say very quickly one minute. What did we do it differently? We have a student and faculty get together to design the course. We do out of sequence. We were teaching things not like in, in particular sequence. And uh, we use the click. So in the classroom, you can directly get response from, uh, from, from students. We got all the mo module-based team project and, and the project of the pre uh, uh, presentation. We got a guest speaker. Things are repeated, re linear regression, logistic regression get repeated. It doesn't matter how much time you repeat. Don't worry about the linear ordering. In real life, when you learn things, repeat is good, out of order is good. Just you know, go with the real, real problem to engage the students. So that's not an issue. We also did a course. Basically, I got a, great, a group of graduate students, which, which is my later become my, uh, known as a happy team. It's a, grad, a group of graduate students. The, course, the purpose of the course is to design a course for the undergraduate students. The course I taught was, was for the first year. Uh, of, initially, it was not for general education, but through this graduate seminar for general education, we were able to, to do that. In this course itself, I don't have time to talk, that we actually talk about all these fallacies. I ask the students to present twice, once as a research problem, once as, as, as pedagogical problem. So this is my happy team, so I'm going to have a happy ending here. Um, let me just finish by saying I find there's enormous interest, uh, dif uh, the similarity between statistics and the wine. The both sides have enormous variations. The, you require the combination of science, engineering, and the arts. Terrible is easy to define and to tell, well, wine and statistics. But what's good is not. And so doing statistics takes practice, 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 just like in drinking, you have to drink, drink, drink. And uh, the final line is, but there is one crucial difference, which I think is very important. Because in wine, we seek complexity. In statistics, we want a simplicity. Thank you very much. <laughs>